Well, I'm Mike Meredith. I'd like to invite you to join me on the next Legal Lines where my guest is our District Attorney for East Baton Rouge Parish, Hiller Moore. Hiller's talking to us about, frankly, the, the tragedies of the last six months or so and the political responses to the war on law enforcement, if you will, and then perhaps also the responses uh, from an on-the-ground standpoint, the folks who are the frontline soldiers. For example, the program Brave. So join us on the next Legal Lines with District Attorney Hiller Moore. It's time now for Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith and I have a Legal Lines tip for you. Remember, knowledge is power. And I want you to know if you're injured, Louisiana law grants you a variety of claims to make sure you're fully compensated. It's generally chopped up into several categories, the first being general damages. That's going to compensate you for your mental and physical pain and suffering, your scarring, disability, functional limitations, your loss of enjoyment of life. Also, it will compensate your family, frankly, for your loss of affection. It's called loss of consortium claim. Next category is specific damages. Those would be, say, for example, past and future lost wages, past and future medical expenses. You also have a claim sometimes for what's called punishment damages or punitive damages, typically only available when you're injured by a drunk party. Finally, you're entitled to legal interest from the date you file your lawsuit until you're paid and court costs. So my legal lines tip to you from me, Locke Meredith. Make sure you know what your claims are. This has been Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith. Hello, welcome to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith. I'm very pleased to have back on the show. I don't know how many times we've done this, Hiller, but uh, Hiller Moore, the District Attorney for East Baton Rouge Parish, it's great to see you again. Good to see you again, Locke. Seems like we're trying to do this at least once a year, and uh, a lot has happened in the last yeah. year. Um, Sorry to hear about your uh, flooding of your office. We've all been through a mess in this uh, parish and Livingston and the rest of the surrounding stuff, It's but God's good. Absolutely. Appreciate you yep. asking. but. Bottom line is, uh, I, I saw where you have recently indicated the murder rate in Baton Rouge has has been at a, a, a significant low compared to previous years. Sure. Uh, last year was really our best year in a long time. Actually, you have to go back to 2004 and then before that to 1980s. Which is great news and I think, you know, we've done so many shows as you indicate. Yeah. Uh, over the years, it's really clear to see a lot of this has to do with the efforts of all of law enforcement yep. implementing different programs. Brave was a big push yep. by you and the rest of the folks, yep. Sid and, and Chief White back then. So, yeah, I mean, you know, if you recall, many years ago we were sitting at your office with, uh, I think, myself, the chief and the sheriff. At That's that right. Point, and we were describing the brave effort, what that would look like. And at that point, really not knowing what was going to happen. I believe that was the first year. So we came up with the idea in 2012 and applied for some grants and actually started in 2013. So 2012 was our baseline year. And that year we had around 83 to 86 homicides. It was pretty which, high. Which is the number that we were normally uh, having. Yeah. Which is really high for the size of our city. Right. I think, I, um, I think there were signs saying higher than Chicago or whatever. Yes. And so, uh, you know, nobody ever wants to be compared to New Orleans or Chicago, but, <laughs> but obviously uh, we were. And so in our first year, we were hoping that we would have five murders less. But fortunately for us, that number dropped 20 to 25 in the first year, and then the second year dropped another one or two. So it had some significant declines. And it wasn't just the law enforcement that you had a big effort, but it was the community. Right. It was a faith-based community. It was the people. It was our government uh, leaders all coming together. But um, you know, I remember uh, at the end of that first year, uh, New Year's Eve, thinking that, you know, I think we really did this this first year and calling the mayor, calling the chief saying, can you believe that we have now reduced murders or possibly we reduced murders right. by 20, the feeling that you would get that you may have Save lives. saved 20 to 25 lives from being killed, but you may have saved 20 to 25 lives or more from Double. going to jail for the rest of their lives. That's so, right. Uh, and their family members. And their families. I mean, so, you know, it's a good feeling. Uh, and we've continued that on. Last year was our best year. The year before we had a little bit of a bump, but we never have gone past our 2012 baseline year. And the year before, we've unfortunately had seven double homicides and two triples, which added to that number. And that's why you saw a little bit of an increase. But by and large, we were good. Uh, we went, went through some months without 
a homicide. So explain the program again real quickly. As I recall, there were kind of two components. You had statistical information that right. you were getting access to that helped y'all figure areas where to go and where crime was a hot spot. Right. And then y'all would set up meetings with kind of the players right. of the crime. Right. So it's the data. It's the data that drives what we do now. And that's by LSU? That's by LSU. Is Shahade, Professor Shahade still heading that and, up? Or and all, you know, all the other professors okay. out there. They all have a different part that they play. Social network analysis, social services, uh, criminology, all have play a part of that, but crunch a lot of numbers, give us data, time, place, person, location. So under BRAVE, this is a group violence reduction strategy. And what it says is that in most cities, groups, gangs, drive your violence, drive homicides. And in fact, we did an audit of our homicides for many years, and groups were driving 50% for homicides. And now you got data. That now we have data that shows. So 50% meaning a victim or the defendant was a member of a group. So if you call these group members in, it's what we call a call-in. You call them in, you invite them in to talk to them. Normally, law enforcement doesn't sit down and talk to And y'all are doing that in a courthouse. Is that the way y'all still doing it? In a courtroom. We call them in 30 or so at a time. You give them a letter, and the letter is signed by all of the elected uh, law enforcement leaders. And it says, we want to invite you to this meeting. We want to talk to you. You're not going to be arrested. This is not a joke. Uh, we believe that you are an influential member of a group and that you could use your influence to influence group members in a positive way. And so we invite them in, and when they come in, they're seated in a particular location in the courtroom, away from other rival gang members. Interesting. And the pictures of their gang members and how many years they're doing in jail, dead bodies of the gang members who have been killed, uh, run on the screen so that they know we know. And we deliver the message, put your guns down and take our help. We want to help you. Well, that's going to be you or you're going to be in jail? Correct. Second, uh, put your guns down, just don't take our help. Third, shoot somebody, either you or your gang. If you shoot somebody or kill someone, the full power of law enforcement is going to come down, not only on the shooter, but every member of your group. And so that's the message we give them. That's followed up by faith-based leaders, community leaders that deliver another faith-based message to them. And the community says, look, you're valuable to us. Mm -hmm. We don't want you going down this line. And this is where you're going to wind up. And the truth of the matter is the stats show that Kids who are members of groups in Baton Rouge are 900 times more likely to kill or be killed than any other person walking the street, which is a, a huge number. 900 times 900 more likely. 900 times more likely. So stay away from the group, you're going to survive. So so you guys are kind of like the stick and the carrot is what? The community f folks surrounding no, and providing is, look, options want, to them they don't have? If you want help, we have help. So as quick as I'm going to put you on the top of my list, if you shoot or kill someone, you going to be on the top of a list you don't want to be on. I'm going to move you to the top of the list if you need transportation, housing, education, mental health. You're going to bump everybody because you're really at risk and you're going to be a problem for the community and yourself. Let me put you at the top of the list. All you need to do is ask for help. Problem is, uh, it's very challenging for these kids to ask for help. Interesting. They generally do not want to take the help. And so it's, it's a socioeconomic kind of mindset you know, you, everything of evaluating. That, everything you can imagine that can go wrong for these kids probably has gone wrong. Uh, neighborhood, family, lack of right. dad, education, mental health, alcohol, drugs. The only family that guy's that gang. That's, that's their relations. Let's talk about the funding because I saw that, uh, you know, I think you said you got 1.5 million from the feds in 13, another million the next year, yeah. and now you're, you're asking, I think you're, I've read 800 grand to yeah, so, see, and you're asking for a little more. So unfortunately, the grant runs out uh, in September. Uh, you know, it's been that long. We didn't know that it would, would do this well. Uh, we still have some money in reserves that we were not able to spend due to some other reasons, and we're trying to ask for an extension to be able to sp spend that money on kids, on services for them. And so hopefully we'll get a favorable answer from them. If not, if the grant ends, then money's returned. And then we have to look for local sources to supply that. And as you know, money is extremely tight, not only for the city, but for the state. If we do not receive any funding, officers are going to have to bear it themselves. And we'll have to do without the bells and whistles and the data, which really drives this. And Hiller, I read normally kind of the evolution of these programs is that it becomes kind of a non nonprofit type of entity sustained. Yes. So Brave uh, Inc. Uh, is a nonprofit now, it's a board, but we're going to try to raise money through outside sources to fund what we need to do. So that's the direction that we're moving in. We have a really good board, an active board, and we're trying to move in that direction right now. 
And so how would folks move, uh, um, if somebody wants to donate or participate, how do they do you it? You always look at Brave. Okay. Uh, and they'll take you to the 501C, make a donation. They're hopefully we're gonna have a more organized effort to have some money, funds donated. Look for other grants, other sources, because we're able to show with the numbers that it works. And of and course, the, the money is, uh, is tax deductible. All right, we'll continue this on the next segment. This is Lock Mary's Legal Lines, the District Attorney of East Baton Rouge Parish, Hillamore. We'll be right back. It's time now for Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith with a Legal Lines Tip for you. Document your claim. What do I mean? Whenever you present a claim, whether it's for injuries in an automobile collision or for a breach of contract case or a business claim, it all boils down to documentation and evidence. For example, when you go to trial, basically both sides are presenting their evidence of what they believe to be their case. For example, also, if you're involved in an automobile collision, document the event. Talk to all the parties who are involved. Get their names, address, contact information, insurance info. Talk to the witnesses on the scene. Also get their contact information. Take photographs with the phones we all have these days. Everybody can take a picture, and that paints a thousand words. So document your claim. The Legal Lines tip from me, Locke Meredith, to you is document the claim. This has been Legal Lines Tips. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith. Again, pleased to have back on the show Hiller Moore. He is our district attorney for East Baton Rouge Parish. Hiller, it's great news to hear that the murder rate has significantly dropped since the implementation of BRAVE. Let's, let's kind of talk about, though, sadly, the turmoil that our city and, frankly, the nation seems to be going through, um, most experienced by us last year, middle of last year, with the deaths of uh, three of our officers and w serious wounding of others, and then yeah. loss of... Uh, Deputy Anderson, I believe, what, yeah. three weeks ago? For, uh, yeah, tough year last year. Hard. I mean, all the way around, just uh, several different officer-involved shootings. Uh, and you, you, I think you were able to see that we wrote a few reports on the officer-involved shooting. And at the end of, beginning of this year, we published a first time ever, um, a year long in review of- I think that was a great idea. Of officer-involved shootings, because people really don't know. And in the past, historically, uh, DAs would take officer involved shootings to the grand jury and the grand jury would clear them of their uh, any potential wrongdoing and and look vast majority of those cases officers were right to do what they did uh, but they you would still take that case because someone is dead you take it to the grand jury to make sure it's just not your decision alone right. that you're making it removes all politics it's all yeah so it's not beyond closed doors as you know the grand jury is secret so as things have evolved over the years police officer involved shootings the protocol now is that if you're if the officer has not done anything wrong and he's clearly right in what he's doing that you as a DA unless there's some issue you wouldn't take that case to a grand jury you would then we would then write a report a very detailed report so everybody can see why I did what I did so if the grand jury sees it the grand jury only says no true bill you have no idea what was said done or heard in a DA's report you see everything. So Everything's it's more accountable? Record. It's more accountable, more transparent. That's interesting. It's, it's responsibly transparent so that you can, if you want to criticize me, you, can, you have something to criticize me on as to this is why I did what I did. That's Here, excellent. Here's, here's the picture. Here's the video. Um, here's what people said as opposed to just being cloaked with grand jury. And, and of course, it seems like a lot of the anger in our society right now seems to be kind of media driven where there's this perception by, by different groups of people that they're a target. Uh, and yeah. then likewise, on the other side of the coin, there are officers now who feel like there's a war on cops. I just got a letter about that. And, yeah. and of course, we've had murders in New York of police officers, Dallas, here and elsewhere. And so uh, it, it seems like accountability is a very important thing to do. Yeah. You know, this is a big deal now. It's the biggest thing that as DAs that you can deal with is officer ball shootings and being responsible, being transparent as you can. Uh, and you know there are different sides. You, you, you've, you've seen and heard the different sides to all of the stories, yes. one way or the other. And um, it's something that we're going to deal with. We'll continue to deal with. We have one decision that we're waiting, as you know, from right, the Department, Department of Justice. Justice. We'll wait to, for that decision. You've seen people locally that have protested uh, different events. You've seen a lot of people come in from out of town, outside right. of Baton Rouge, coming here to do things that are not correct to our own city. Right. And hopefully we're not going to let that happen. And I, I will say our community, despite this huge chasm yeah. and, and hurt yes. and anger, 
really has, has handled this? There's a lot of historical issues here that we're dealing with that really get dealt on the steps of law enforcement, police, sheriffs, that they have to deal with. And really, we're not equipped to do that. We're not trained for that, not equipped to, we're not funded to do those things, but it's laid at our doorstep. You know, well, who's the first person you call when there's an issue? Calling the police the first ones you call. Yeah. Uh, and uh, They wear so many workers, hats. So many hats. Very difficult. Yeah, I, I, and frankly, from what uh, Sheriff Sid Gocho was telling me, nationally there has been where these type of investigations have occurred or events have occurred, law enforcement is pulling back or leaving yeah. and crime is going so, sky high. So if you read people like, you know, uh, happen to read a lot on these issues, it's called the Ferguson effect. And or some people say it's the so-called Ferguson effect. You can, you can get research and data on either side. I believe that the Ferguson effect is real. I believe that officers have pulled back, not only not necessarily Baton Rouge, but across the nation. And you could see response times to uh, how they've increased, how they decreased, sorry, after officer involved shootings, how each side, they don't know how to treat each other. They're kind of standing back. And that's something you don't want to have because it hurts no. public safety. But I believe that it's real. It's not only real here, it's real all around the country. From my research, it does not seem that Baton Rouge has had that effect quite as much as other bigger cities. I think that you saw the uh, summer where we had our issues, then you saw the flood, so you saw a big division, Unity. then you saw a lot of people that really came back, all different walks of life, colors, creeds, helping each other out, and you could just see it. But before that, you could feel a tenseness, and then you could see people opening doors at a it's such, an, store. Uh, it's such a spiritual component you can, to it. You can you see would, it, you uh, can feel it. Interesting. Uh, so I think people started to maybe open their eyes and say, let me think how that person thinks. Let me walk in his steps for a while. Maybe I can become better. Maybe it's, uh, there's something to the other side. Uh, so yes, it's a uh, trouble, troubling year. Well, it seems like as a re response to all of this, we're kind of having two tr tracks taking place. One, there's political kind of attempts to address the situation, then I call it the guys who are the frontline soldiers who are, are addressing it, which frankly seem more practical because they're on the front line. But I know ev even here in Baton Rouge, uh, our new mayor, Sharon Broom, has, has uh, implemented a new policy, police policy, uh, yeah. and, and really from what I understand it, Chief uh, Davity said this is already the way we yeah. do things, but it's great to have it codified yeah. because it makes these these officers more accountable. Yeah, let me say, uh, Chief Davity has done a fabulous job as our chief of police and respect him as a person, great friend. Uh, but the things that now are codified in the police manual, that's what's always been trained at the police academy. However, it's now very clear, it's in writing, but steps that they've been taking all along to do, you know, de-escalation techniques, which you'd surely want to do. I mean, get everybody cool off. You surely want to do that in your own life, you want to do that with your children. Sure. So it makes sense for police officers. However, police officers have to really be wary of where they are, what they're doing. We've had attacks on officers all around the country. In fact, they're up this year, just ambushes. Uh, so tough time right now. But, um, you know, this is not going to be solved from the top down, from the governor, the mayor, DA. It's going to be solved from the bottom up with a lot of help from the top. It's got to be solved on a community level, on a street, on a family level. And we really have to work, I don't know how, to get a family back. If you put the family back, maybe you can put your neighborhood and your community back. Amen. And that is going to be a, that's a challenge. And hopefully the churches and the faith-based and the community leaders can get together and show how this is the only way we're going to be able to survive. Uh, and Brave is, again, evidence that that does have yeah. success. It, it, can, it can absolutely work. Brave's component is to reach out to the community, make the community a better place, and have a better relationship with police and the community. You know, which we need, uh, not just Baton Rouge, but all right. over. Because right. there's a lot of unknown between the two different sides, that, if there is such a thing as two, uh, because they have to be, we have to really be one. I notice, uh, of course, that we have the legislature for the state uh, gathering again, what is it, April 10th, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and one of the big issues facing the legislature is going to be this crime uh, kind of remodel. Uh, proposition or program that's yeah. being put forth and it's dealing with with folks who are currently incarcerated and trying as I read to reduce the prison population by 13 percent yes uh, so it's called the justice Re justice reinvestment uh, committee and test all right well we'll continue this on the next segment this is Lock Mayor of Legal Lines District Attorney East Baton Rouge Parish Hillamore we'll be right back
It's time now for Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith with a Legal Lines Tip for you. Document your claim. What do I mean? Whenever you present a claim, whether it's for injuries in an automobile collision or for a breach of contract case or a business claim, it all boils down to documentation and evidence. For example, when you go to trial, basically both sides are presenting their evidence of what they believe to be their case. For example, also, if you're involved in an automobile collision, document the event. Talk to all the parties who are involved. Get their names, address, contact information, insurance info. Talk to the witnesses on the scene. Also get their contact information. Take photographs with the phones we all have these days. Everybody can take a picture and that paints a thousand words. So document your claim. The Legal Lines tip from me, Locke Meredith, to you is document the claim. This has been Legal Lines Tips. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith. Pleased to have back on the show Hiller Moore. He's the District Attorney for East Baton Rouge Parish. Hiller, we're talking about the turmoil we went through, kind of the political response to it with the mayor uh, proposing some policing policies. Um, and, and of course, you've been really successful with BRAVE. What else do you need? Because that encompass, encompasses a lot of components of what we've discussed. Am I correct that you're seeking 125 grand from the mayor and, and the Metro Council? We're looking for some additional money just to uh, continue to support the uh, crime strategy unit. Okay. It's an intelligence-driven prosecution unit where I've taken uh, two members of uh, two assistant DAs, three DA investigators, and one victim's assistance counselor out of the line work that we do, which does have an impact on what we do, and put them in this uh, strategy unit which has been extremely successful. Right, and so that and sure seems like a good way to spend that money. Really good way, and without some additional money, I'll eventually have to take them and put them back where they are, but they have reached out to the federal authorities uh, and uh, the city police and the sheriff and the state police, been phenomenal partners, and uh, we think that that has a, had a significant inc uh, effect of the murder reduction okay. last year. So let's shift back to the, to the state kind of political movement to deal with reform of, of uh, prison right. population. Tell me again the so, name of it. Justice Reinvestment. That's an interesting title. So, you know, Louisiana, as you know, has the highest incarceration rate. In the world, world. is yes. it? Yeah, we've talked and, about it. And, you know, you don't want to you don't want to be on that list. It's not a Louisiana, bad uh, Louisiana like seems to be on the top or the bottom of every worst list right. that you can be on. So, surely not something that you want to have. You know, why is Louisiana there? Is it historical reasons? Is it because of our laws? Is, is it prosecutors and judges that are too tough? What is it? Uh, I think a lot has to do with why we're on the top and the bottom of a lot of lists. Uh, literacy, uh, poverty, education, you name it. And I think that all of those are drivers of crime. So why are we there? Uh, the justice reinvestment uh, was put together by the legislature, Governor John Bell. Look, good, well-intended people right. with well-intended ideas. Right. We disagree at this point on some of those, particularly as it relates to violent offenders. The whole theory behind justice reinvestment is they believe that we incarcerate too many nonviolent offenders. And I would suggest that uh, your listeners, if they look at any reports that are out there, and in fact, when uh, I release my report from my office, you're going to see that the nonviolent offender that's in jail is a burglar who's a nonviolent offender, because burglary is considered nonviolent. Right. He's burglarized three to five to 50 times, and you've placed him on probation many times. He's reoffended. What do you want me to do with him? Where should I put him? Louisiana. He's going to do it again. Recidivism rate is sky high as yes. it is. What is it? Fifty percent? Depends 60%? on depends on the year when they release. It's uh, from thirty three to sixty five percent from one year to five years. So. And you indicated earlier th so, in our private talks, you, you're lucky to catch them fifty percent of the time when they do commit a crime. So crime. research shows that if you get to this person within the first eleven days of release, and he has a plan that's in place, your chance to survive him to survive is much better. Research also shows if someone from his home neighborhood visits him regularly while he's in prison, likelihood that he's going to uh, do well. Or he has a job, he has a TWIC card, uh, driver's license. So we're releasing folks without a lot of help. Uh, Jimmy LeBlanc has done a great job now trying to make things different with the Department of Corrections. And we've seen an 8% reduction in our prison population over the last several years. So we're doing things that work. The, the wholesale nature of the justice reinvestment is scary to us, especially making it retroactive to re, uh, release violent offenders, armed robbers. Uh, all the way back. All the way back to. Whether you've been there one day or 100 to, years. To the percentage that 
is now being proposed. So it wouldn't let everybody out of jail on one day. Uh, I think the goal is to, uh, under this scheme, to release 3,000 to 5,000 folks over a period of time. And the idea is you would shut beds down and you'd save money. I read, what, 15 million a 15 year? 15 million, and the state would reinvest this money. In what? The state would reinvest at least 50% back into corrections, and that would be the folks that are getting out of prison, they're going right back to the same place without a lot of services. We have no infrastructure, no services to help these people as they come out to jail and then eventually return. We have no infrastructure to help kids in the pipeline that they right. take from We've talked about child. this over and over. So now, now you want to, you're gonna claim that you're gonna reinvest 50%. There's absolutely no way to tie the hands of the legislature to make them reinvest 50%. Not to mention the fact that we're broke. And if they did reinvest that 50%, they could always take 50% away on a different end. Uh, so we've been promised reinvestment before with the Missouri model, the juvenile plan. That money's never been reinvested. Department of Corrections in the last eight years, how, how they survive, how uh, Warden Le uh, Jimmy LeBlanc does his job, I have no idea. They've been cut $180 million over the last eight, last eight years. That department is struggling. We need to give them more help. We as DAs, we are for sensible, reasonable reductions of prison population. And you're the past president of the DA Association. Yeah. So let's find out why are people going to jail and let's stop them from going to jail in the first place. That's where I'd like to get have the money. Uh, help them on the back end as they come out, get them in programs, get them more supervision. But just to let folks out of jail, right now a probation officer's workload is, is 150 cases per, per officer. Person. Now, you think if you had if you had 150 children, what kind of a father are you going to be to your children? You're going to try as hard as you can. You're not going it's to get impossible. To, it's going to be impossible. So you try to maybe and we're going to bump that up by three to five thousand people. And so it makes it more difficult. And look, the Department of uh, Probation Pro the officers that we work with here are phenomenal. They're just overworked. They do a great job. So and you know Jimmy's turnover rate is is so much. It's 220 percent. It's a tough tough business to be in. So all I do is I just ask people to be cautious, listen to our practical side as to why we oppose or why we want to work differently on the legislation. We've agreed that we want to work, make most of this right. Some we're going to draw the line at of violent offenders. It's, it's interesting because your point is well taken that it's not like this person just did one crime and now they're in prison. They will have, have to been caught, which is 50% chance they won't, then prosecuted through the whole system, then sentenced, So, and it's multiple times the that you've given the, them chances. The key, the key number is 58% of the people that are classified as nonviolent that have been placed in jail are there because they've been revoked. They've committed another offense when you gave them a chance the first time. 58% of being revoked within the first year. So, so the bottom line, we're going to let 3,000 to 5,000 folks out where we haven't prepared them to become productive citizens of our society. So what about the safety of the general public? So, so our opposition uh, is public safety. We, we say, let's, let's take a slower, more cautious approach. We're all for making that uh, number, uh, reducing that number. We don't want to be on that list. We want to be somewhere else off that list. But we are gradually working our way there. We do want to assist that number. We want to do it safely. Let's talk about the other programs that you, you're really excited about right now. Yeah. I know you did this domestic violence program recently. You know, the domestic violence is just, uh, the, the numbers that we see is crazy. Uh, sex offenses for uh, not only adult sex offenses, but sex offenses on children. Uh, that number has just continued to increase. Uh, you saw the end of the year domestic violence report. You saw the end of the year officer involved shooting report. What really struck us when we were issuing that report, the day of the report, is that how much how mental health and domestic violence fits into officer involved shootings and homicides. And so you're focused on that. You're also pushing the truancy, truancy center, uh, center to help pushing the kids. it from all different ends because there's a lot of people out there that are hurting really bad, and we need to give them services and. You know, it's it's not your traditional DA's office anymore where you simply prosecute. We're doing more things. Hiller, thank you so much. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Great to see you again. This is Lockbetter with Legal Lines. My great guest, Hiller Moore, District Attorney of East Baton Rouge Parish. Thank you for being with us.